Hello and welcome to this platform con 2024 session. So I'm going to describe how uh, we could help a platform team uh, focused on engineering to switch to a product-based approach. Uh, and so we are working at DKB. So DKB is a middle-sized German bank, so with about 5 million customers, 5,000 employees, so founded in 1990. So that means that we are a bit halfway between the, the, the old banks, the ones with the mainframes in the cellar, and between the fintechs. So that's quite an interesting situation. And now about myself, uh, my name is Stéphane Di Cesare. I work since one year in the platform experience team of the standard operations platform. So this is the platform we're going to talk about today. Uh, I have a background lately in technology consulting, also worked in, in different areas, infrastructure automation and so on. Uh, I am trying to become a platform as product specialist. Uh, trying to in, in, introduce this uh, product thinking uh, into the platform. Uh, to do that, I'm also a member of the, the CNCF working group working on platforms within the app delivery tag. And I have a big interest for linguistics and languages, uh, come from France, uh, based in Munich in Germany at the moment. So where did we start from? Um, so in the beginning, the standard operation platform was formed from different teams with different backgrounds, uh, but focused on infrastructure. At the core was a container platform, which was using the, the open source project Crossplane. And uh, the goal was to that this becomes the standard platform and that it, it, ha it can be used as a product. And as I mentioned in the beginning, it was focused on engineering. So basically, we had uh, mostly the bottom of the stack here. It means we had we could have workloads run, which is a very good situation. It's not like that everywhere. Uh, we can iterate fast because we have a productive environment uh, where workloads can actually run. But it means also we had the communication had a strong engineering focus. So it was mostly aimed at people with a strong infrastructure background and was not always easy to understand for uh, people coming from the outside and especially for developers. Our goals uh, and challenges was so we wanted to be able to show to the business what is the value of the platform, what does it actually bring. It was quite clear for engineering people what it what it brings, but it's also good if you can show the value to the people who actually have the budget. Uh, and we also wanted to see uh, how we can improve the platform. Um, we wanted to improve how we talk with uh, our users and, and the business users, uh, make co cognitive load easier, so make uh, things as much as possible easy for platform teams so that they need to know as little as possible about for topics like infrastructure, compliance, security, and to provide as much as possible standard processes and tools. So I'm going to focus on five steps in the, which were important in our platform journey. First is to define what the platform is, what are we actually working on. Then clarify uh, what is the maturity of the platform. So where are we now and where can we go further? Then look at uh, the focus on product topic. How do we work product based? And finally, look at the communication quickly and at how we manage documentation and information. So looking at defining the platform. Uh, so the, we created a platform architecture. So the goal was to describe the platform, especially to people like architects in the product teams and business users so that they can, so that they can understand what is this platform actually doing? What does it help with? Uh, who are the users? So you, you can see here in the diagram, uh, users are not only the developers, but they are also uh, people working on the platform internally. They are DevOps teams who are helping developers. They are also um, um, people coming from the side, I would say, compliance, security, who might, who might have wishes about this is what you need to implement in the platform. 
So we decided to create different layers. So there are different models. So these models were not known to us at the, when we started. Uh, so in the middle, you can see a platform layer. So this is basically how um, the, the tools, how it's implemented. The user layer is the part that's user facing. So where you have things like user interfaces, but also processes. How do you do onboarding in the platform or communication? Then there are resources. These are the uh, curated high level resources that are available to end users. And we have a common layer where we have topics like best practices. Uh, this is where uh, a team like security w w would come in and say, oh, we noticed this security problem. Ensure that here the best practices are up to date. And then the, this will have an impact on the implementation that's here. And so there are different ways to model this. So I gave some, uh, some examples below. You, you can have a look at it to, to go further. Then in these squares, what do we have? So how do we detail the capabilities? So this is, we decided to do it based on use cases. So here we define what is the use case? So who wants to do what? And the value, why? What does it bring? So it's good if it's in money. It's not always possible to put it in money. So here in this example, a developer wants to be able to view the, the, the cost of the resources. It doesn't bring it anything as such, but it helps the developer to know what are the costs and to improve them afterwards. And here we document as well. Uh, so first, before documenting, uh, we describe what are possible solutions, at, at which points it would become tickets in, a, in Scrum. And then we describe how is this documented. So first, how we, uh, uh, how we architected or designed the solution, and then how is this uh, usable by the end users? And the goal of this uh, is when there is any change with this use case, then we know straight away the related pieces of documentation we need to update. And also, what is the responsibility? Who takes care of it? Who, uh, uh, who owns the, the use case as well? And what is the status? Is it something that's complete or is it something that's still in beta? And there can be different solutions with different states. We also uh, made the heat map. So this, this is what it looked like in the beginning, where we have on the left side the implementation stat status and on the right side the definition status. So he, uh, he, the, basically the left side is does it work? And uh, on the right side is, do we really know exactly what it's supposed to do? So we see as, as we came from uh, from the, the bottom of the stack, we had quite a lot of stuff that was running. Basically, the core of the platform was running, but not extremely easy to understand from the outside. And this is useful for management to understand what is the state of the platform, what do we need to improve? And then when we define the platform, continuous improvement is important. The platform is evolving. There is input that's coming from users. So this must be updated. And developers are not your, your only user. So you can have uh, requirements coming from compliance, from security, uh, from, uh, from the cloud engineers themselves, everything related to maintenance. This is important to, to, uh, to note it down as well. So that you can uh, you can show uh, why are uh, your engineers spending time on maintenance? What does it bring? Um, and the difficulties here were that people are not always used to work at this abstraction level, and uh, you need to put updating the use cases in the workflow for basically everything you do. You should always check: is there a use case re a related use case? and maintain the information. This is not always very simple, especially um, uh, especially when you're in emergencies and when you're fixing an emergency, the first priority is, of course, not to fix uh, the wording of the use case. But it's good to be able to do it uh, afterwards. Then let's talk about platform maturity. So here we used the CNCF platform maturity model, where there is the link below. Uh, there is an excellent introduction made by Nikki Watts at the Platform Engineering Day. So this is free to watch. You can, you can have a look at it for, for an introduction. 
And here I'm not going to go in the details, but uh, this shows uh, where is the platform compared to uh, what is possible to implement in a platform and uh, wh where we can improve. Uh, and this is uh, what were the possibilities for us to improve in the beginning of the project. Uh, so what, what were the possibilities to go? And this has the advantage that uh, this way, the leadership can give a clear view of where do we want to focus? Do we want to go to, to, to look especially at the adoption operations and to have long-term goals that are easier to follow than just uh, uh, the backlog of the next sprint? Then speaking about product, uh, we had uh, the difficulties. Uh, as an engineer, I was used that there is a definition for, for uh, new terms you learn. You go in the documentation and it's clear. It's unfortunately not like that for a word like product. So we had to find a common agreement and understand what are actually our products, uh, how many do we actually have, and our interpretation in the end was that it's important that the platform team can decide about what is in the product, about the features. The decision doesn't come from the outside. Uh, it must be uh, explained from the outside why we need to do something. Uh, it's important as well that the product is ident products are identifiable for the platform users. They will they have to be able to know. This is in that part, this is in that product or in that other product. If you have a platform, they must know is it in the container platform or the VM platform. If they, if it's not clear, then you don't have the right product or the right definition at least. Uh, then the features must be streamlined and well defined. It's not possible to, uh, to, to be not clear about what is proposed by the product. Um, and the usage must be clear as well. The users must know how to find information, how to use the product. So what we decided to do was to split into different products, especially container and VM. Uh, under that, we have capabilities. So this is what they had in the platform architecture. And the, to these correspond implementation. So you can have a capability that is imp implemented in different ways on in different products. Uh, and then you can decide below which teams is uh, responsible for which implementation. Uh, and the advantage of this is that the users are talking at the product level. They don't need to know what happens under. So you can take decisions faster and you can also organize yourselves in product teams. So this is very flexible. Uh, and you can you can change assignments without having an impact on the user. Then some challenges we had. Um, the responsibility for product management activities, uh, so delivery strategy especially, is, is disconnected. So we have different people who are looking at where the product is going to and where the product uh, is the product actually being built. And especially in Scrum, very often in practice, you will end up in a situation where the product owner tends to focus on the delivery and is not doesn't have the resources to look at the long term. So for this, it's useful to, to centralize the responsibility for product management. And you can, of course, use delegation, but it's, it, it must, it must, uh, everything must uh, go back to uh, one person, if possible. Uh, then uh, team encapsulation. So I mean by that, that uh, in Scrum, sometimes uh, people try to protect the team from the outside, which is good, so they're not disturbed all the time, but it's it also disconnect them from the business view. And it's good to involve team members in uh, such activities, in product activities sometimes, for example, doing use case workshops or working with uh, end users in a control way. Um, as I was saying before, uh, especially in topics such as compliance, you will have teams that come to you and say, you must do this that way now. Um, and it's important not, not to destroy the principle of the platform that the platform decides on what we do and how it's being done. 
sometimes uh, the business value is very clear. So if you don't implement uh, this uh, uh, regulatory requirement, the CEO will go to prison, for example. Business value is then very simple to, to argue. Uh, but the decision must be, uh, the team must decide on their own what the implement implementation is. Then let's look at communication. Um, some concepts uh, we noticed can be can be difficult, can have different meanings when you talk to different people. So when you work on a platform like that, you will be in contact with uh, different stakeholders who have very different backgrounds. And words like service, like products, like platform or architecture, they can mean very different things. Uh, so you need to find common definitions or to agree on what is the definition in a specific context. And it's more important to, to reach an agreement than being sure that uh, you have the right definition. What's important is what works. And uh, one way to avoid uh, to avoid misunderstandings is uh, when you use words like that, which are very overloaded, uh, to use to prefix them with the context. So you, when you talk about a, a service, uh, you will tell uh, if you are mean a Kubernetes service or an ITSM service, for example. And communication is uh, communication should be handled as a feature of the platform. So. Also, look at what are your use cases, um, uh, what are the what are the, the persona, what do you need to do? Uh, so this is not only about incidents or change requests, and there are you you have to look uh, to look at it as a whole, uh, looking at topics like, for example, how do you ask quick questions? So maybe uh, Slack or Teams is a good way to do that. Uh, how do you have a larger consulting for the platform? I need to bring uh, my product team to the platform. Uh, I need some assistance for someone doing architecture, for example, um, emergency situations, and so on. Uh, sorry, I uh, went the wrong way. Uh, then about documentation. So what uh, engineers think about uh, the documentation, very often they will think about the user documentation. This is only part of it. Um, and there is more to documentation uh, of topics like the architecture, documentation, which are which is for uh, external stakeholders, people like project manager who, would need, who will need a high level view. So here as well, uh, think as a product. And document who are your persona, who are your use cases, where is where is the value, and uh, it's good to streamline, but it's very important to keep the overview. So if you try to force too much a specific medium, then you will have shadow documentation and people who will document things outside. So then it's important to uh, um, to, to keep the to keep the overview uh, as a first goal, and here. Psychological safety is very important, so you should avoid people saying that this is obvious or this you should already know, because the best way to improve your uh, uh, your documentation is people telling you, "I don't understand this," uh, and it must be uh, it must be okay in your culture to say something like that without being blamed. So that this is very important. So that's it for it for me today. Uh, I'm looking at uh, feedback about this presentation. Uh, if you've done something similar, if you had other ideas, if you know things that work better, I'm very interested. Uh, and what we would like to know as well internally is to improve the that everybody participates in, uh, in this uh, platform architecture. For the moment, it's been driven by a, a small team, and we would like to know how to involve more people. And you can contact me on LinkedIn. Uh, thanks for listening to me. So wish you a good uh, continuation of the conference. Have a nice day.